We're going to talk about that state of mobility report right now uh, with my coworkers and friends. So let me start with the first question for Will. What is sort of the most frequent policy change you've seen clients make in the last 12 to 24 months? Yeah, I would uh, distinguish it between <clears throat> actual policy changes and then policy changes that are a hot topic of discussion. So the, the latter, uh, I think the uh, proliferation of, of uh, core flex and the discussion around is this right for me has been a very hot topic. Uh, and then really not a policy change but more of an emphasis away from say long-term assignments towards uh, one-way transfers internationally. If we need you in Singapore, it's not going to be for three years. You're moving to Singapore type thing. Okay. Yep. Avoid that tax equalization. Bill Niemer, what do you think is the biggest thing that you've heard people talk about as a policy change, but they say, oh yeah, we're still waiting to get that approved. We're still waiting to get that approved. Yeah. So uh, to, to Will's point, I think CoreFlex is, has been the talk for several years, but trying to get it implemented and figuring out what's core and what's flex is, is a daunting task for, for many companies. Um, many of our clients are very concerned about equity across uh, a population, and others are really into creating that flexibility in the choice. And how do you do that in a particular policy level and a tier for, for different types of policies? I've also heard a lot of clients talk about um, how they can have their policy be just in time for the need of that move. So rather than the level of that employee, it's more on the, on the purpose of the move. So am I filling an open job that I have to fill and I have to do a relocation for it? Am I doing this as a developmental move, uh, de de developmental rotation or assignment? Um, or is this something that is an employee choice where they, they are self-electing to go on it? So trying to create programs that, that fit that has been a lot of talk, but not a lot of action yet. So Yeah, and is relocation a benefit or compensation? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All those who think that's a compound <laughs> answer, raise your hand. <laughs> I like it. Explain. Yeah, so tactically, I would say if it's a lump sum, it's a compensation, and if it's a managed move, it's a benefit. Yeah, I, I think it, it depends on what's driving the relocation, right? If it's a, uh, an offshoot of the war on talent, right, where we have to get this talent to this place, uh, it is, it's, you know, you can look at it from a compensatory perspective, right? Whereas certainly if it's a, I want to move or this is part of my career pathing, then that's, can be looked at as a benefit. So I, I, I like the yes answer quite frankly. <laughs> of, course you do. Around that. Yes. of course you do. <laughs> All right. There's a section in the report uh, around budget and the cost of relocation. How much do you think budget is coming into play with the clients that you work with right now, Marta? Either from the program manager level, are they very budget focused, and then from the transferee level? This is a very, very interesting question because what we hear about all the time is exceptional employee experience. And when we look at providing exceptional employee experience, the next topic is budget. Are we looking at cost savings, cost avoidance, or are we looking at that exceptional concierge level experience? So in my experience, uh, budgets always matter, always have, and always will. It's business, and it differs. They do differ w within the same customer they might. There might be some businesses that bring in more revenue and they provide completely different packages to their employees. And on the other side, there might be those that relocate one or two people a year and, and they provide a lump sum. Um, but ultimately, there is always discussion on budgets, there is always accruing, and there is always anticipation that we arrive very closely with the actuals to what we have estimated. So critical, absolutely critical. Yeah. I, I think when you talk about budgeting, it, it isn't necessarily about cost containment, it's about predictability, uh, and it's about expectation management in terms of what this is gonna cost the hiring manager or the business line uh, owner. Uh, if you will. It certainly can be about we want to stay within a certain budget, mm -hmm. but I, I think uh, oftentimes 
um, a budget means allowing for predictability. And so when you roll out things like Core Flex, is there a way to have predictable costs and cost certainty, even though there is this flex element and you're not quite sure what's gonna be chosen beyond the, the core benefits. Mm -hmm. Bill, what about this concept of choice architecture or um, directing somebody's decision? I think that it's made the job of the relocation uh, consultant a little bit more challenging because I think they, rather than just administering the benefits and the transfer will or will not use what's, what's there based on their needs, it's helping to, uh, I mean, we're, we're considered a trusted advisor. And based on what they tell us, uh, we can, I think a big part of our job, part of our responsibility is to guide that employee to what's available and how they can maximize their benefits. So if it's a budgeted move, how can they get the most out of their budget? If it's a core flex, you know, which, which components of that core flex are going to really meet their needs? And then be prepared for course corrections, because I think everybody sets out with a plan on day one, and then things change. Um, if you're a U.S. Uh, employee who has a home sale and your home is not selling, it changes everything, right? It changes the whole dynamics mm -hmm. of what you would need. Day one, you were not thinking that. If you're an expat and you have a delay because of uh, possible visa or immigration issues or transit of your goods uh, time, things, things are constantly changing. So I think as we go to more flexible benefits, the role of the relocation consultant becomes more important to truly be that project manager, or someone who's guiding that move through and explaining what the options are and talking about the pros and cons with that employee and their family so they can make wise choices. I think in my experience, surveys, benchmarking will always matter. Seven out of 10 recommends this and that. And a lot of times uh, clients would ask me how other clients of yours are doing this, or what's Grable's benchmark, you know, average spend per night in Dallas for temporary accommodations. So I think that our customers rely on our expertise and the fact that we have this plethora of clients globally that can provide that, that survey type data. So I think it's only going to be more desired. Yep, agreed. Nawzad, what's one of the biggest trends that you see happening right now in either APAC or in India? I think a lot of focus uh, is intra-APAC or intra-India moves as well. So a lot of benefits erstwhile which were lump sum or which were co-flex are now getting into managed moves with uh, what I see in intra-India. Uh, there is a need for guidance, there is a need for ensuring that a person moving from point A to point B in India is also given that managed move service and duty of care rather than just providing lump sum. Mm -hmm. And that is true for maybe inbound to India from say Singapore or, and who is maybe an Indian national who is stayed here for 10 years, uh, who is out of India for 10 years and coming back. Uh, those are the cases which need more attention because taking for granted that they were in, they were known to the Indian way of doing things. I think being away from the country for 10 years and coming back, I think they need a lot more assistance and handholding than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Because they, we A, have to undo the things that are there in the mind and then redo it rather than having a blank slate. So these intra APAC and intra India managed moves is something that we are seeing. Will, what have been some of the biggest changes in experience for transferees or assignees that you've noticed in the last 12 or 18 months? They want, uh, what they expect is, um, uh, you know, uh, services on their schedule and at their convenience, right? So uh, minimize their disruption, minimize the time they have to focus on things, and then uh, they're ready to execute we're, we're ready to execute services based on their timeline. I think that's how the expectation uh, has gone. And that's, you know, that again speaks a little bit to that old nexus of high touch and high tech. It's, it's not one nexus. It needs to adjust based on uh, the, the cadence of the transferee's uh, needs, um, willingness to use technology and maximize technology versus the traditional uh, consultative approach. 
flexibility is probably the easiest way to put it. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's such a managing expectations piece to it because in the world where you press a button on your phone and the car shows up five minutes later, or you have a dinner reservation in two seconds, um, you cannot pull together a work permit or have your immigration docs ready on your way to the airport. It sure. doesn't work that way. Bill, did you have a comment on what you think is changing in terms of experience? Yeah, I, I think what we're seeing continuing to grow is the is and it's more about what they're not getting. We're seeing less full service moves and more lump sums. And a lump sum is not necessarily just a cash payment. It is a cash payment and usually something else. Um, so I would call those limited benefit moves. Um, and then they have that spend that they have to figure out how they are gonna maximize it to get the other things that they need to get done. Before the tax law changed in the US, we had a lot of moves that were what we call lump sum plus or lump sum plus household goods. We took advantage of the tax code of that being non-taxable and the remaining balance we would use as a, as a lump sum payment. We you know, certainly have seen with that all being taxable now with the uh, tax code changed two years ago, um, that it's all lump sum and now it's more of a free for all with their with their dollars. I don't see it changing. I, it's, it's, it, there's, a, there's a growing population of people that are getting that limited benefit. Marta, if I wave a magic wand right now and now you're in the audience and you run a corporate global mobility program, mm -hmm. what would you tell your relocation management company that you think they need to know that would help you be more effective or help me be more effective as your RMC or any of our great uh, sponsors and suppliers are in the audience? Data quality, data scheme. Okay. So we hmm. can create a great narrative and a great story, but unless I have accurate data reported on a regular basis and ideally have our HR system integrated with yours, um, I'm not going to be able to grow and optimize, scale up or scale down the program as I need to. That's what I believe the, the mobility uh, managers um, are facing today from the employee perspective. <coughs> really think of technology as people first technology. Be able to support the program that has been shaped by our customers and be flexible enough to deliver a very typical benefits, the same benefits policy by policy, just maybe the parameters are differently, but in a different manner, in a customized manner, in a manner that matters to the employee. Because if we don't get the front lines right, Data doesn't matter, nothing else matters. Hmm. If employee are, employees are not happy, then we're not doing good on our initial promise, which is duty of care. Now, Zad, just in real simple terms, and you'll see this uh, in one of the buttons in the state of mobility report, what are the highest priorities for clients specifically in India today? What are they most focused on when, when you meet with those clients and they say, now Zad, we have to fix this or we have to get this right? Okay, I think budgeting and cost and balancing that with uh, duty of care and customer experience. Mm -hmm. So that's a thin line that you got to tread wherein you got to provide the maximum for the minimum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's universal. I thought, here, I thought it was specific to India. Marta, what is the highest priority for the clients when I ask you that question, when you think about the last six or 12 months? Sure. Lots of conversations on return on investment, or as we refer to it, return on mobility. So once we do the magic wand and I am in the perfect world and we have all of the data and then we can build stories and support them with the data that we can sit at the leadership table and we can put forth initiative. It can be something small like rewriting uh, one policy or changing parameters around the benefit and we create that return. We are able to present to the, to the business and to the leadership return mobility. I feel I've experienced that there is a lot of pressure on mobility function to, in a way, generate revenue, even if it's through cost avoidance or just showing that return on investment. Second um, item that I see a lot is program structure and flexibility, and we've spoken here quite a bit about that. Um, do we go back to capped managed moves? Um, are we 
looking at core flex? Are we sticking to the tiered approach? That employee experience is underlying everything that the mobility function is focusing on, but we're trying also to innovate a bit and provide the support to, you mentioned five generations. Millennials are gonna be in 2025, there'll be 75% of the workforce. So there's gotta be a change in those policies and I think that that's top of mind for mobility function. How, how do we capture and keep that group engaged? Will any priorities to add to either uh, Nauzad or Marta? Oh, I, I think it's interesting when you define employee experience, it's from whose perspective? Right, so from a, a hiring managers or the business perspective, th they're, gonna, they're gonna look at employee experience being maximized by narrowing the time to land, right? Did you get whomever uh, at destination productive in a short period of time? From the transferees perspective, it, it might be, did you not burden or stress my trailing family? So it's. You know, it, it, it's important, it's always an element, it needs to be top of mind, but you also need to know that, that the definition of that and the, how you prioritize that varies depending on, on the stakeholder. Bill Niemer, there's a section in the State of Mobility Report about the U.S. housing market. Yeah. Um, what are the key metrics and sort of trends, A, that you're seeing, and B, that you're always watching to see if it's gonna be like a 2014 housing market or a 2008? Yeah, well, hopefully we'll never see a 2008 again. Um, I'm old enough to have been through multiple housing cycles. I think what it's gone back to, and get up the metrics for a moment, just talk in general, is that we have gone to more of a regional real estate market in the United States. So you don't have something that's affecting every market everywhere uh, like we had in 2008 and 2009. We are seeing some markets that homes are, are continually appreciating at a very high rate. There's a low supply and I'm always looking at kind of what, the, what that growth curve is, what's the median price change month over month, quarter, out, quarter over quarter. So I'm really looking at, at, at price changes. Um, days on market, of course, always tell me a little bit of a story because if homes are on a market for a little mm. bit longer time, it tells me that there's um, an opportunity to, uh, for a transfer coming in to possibly get the price off the list price, get the sell price down. Um, the great news, I, I mean, this is a, a standard conversation with transfer. Great, great news, your home sold at list price. Bad news is you're going into a market where homes are selling over list price. Um, that's not an unreal conversation today. So um, I'm, I'm a little bit more bullish on the real estate market probably than some because I think that We've, we've, our lending practices in the United States have changed to such that I think there are a lot more intelligent decisions being made. There's uh, not the risk, glo uh, you know, throughout the U.S. of, uh, of a bubble burst. Yeah. But, I mean, I grew up where, you know, if oil prices um, dropped and mm -hmm. the energy corridors in the U.S. Um, were impacted, that impacted housing prices in those areas. Yeah. Um, you know, what's the bellwether for the United States today? I don't think there is, because we're so diversified in, in our markets. Um, even, in, even in the areas where we're previously energy heavy, they've, they've diversified their, their employment base. I, I agree, housing markets have become more hyper-local, and we don't see the run-up to the, the bubble that had burst in, in 2008 from a loan securitization and that nightmare, that hot potato nightmare. Um, but there are some general trends, uh, demographic, right? Uh, the propensity of millennials or the prioritization around buying a home for millennials is markedly different. It's not the American dream it was for the boomers and the Gen X. It, it wasn't uh, a, a nearly a priority. So yes, hyper-local, especially when you look at markets that have building restrictions, very tight restrictions in California. Um, uh, it's hyper local when you look at the success of our mega cities versus rural areas, right? That's a, it's a, a in the, within the same state, you've got a vastly different housing markets that are hyper local. But at the same time, there are demographic trends and general trends that could affect an entire market. I think that comes around to exactly, you know, is buying a house that American dream as it was decades ago? And the answer seems to be no. It's not a, not a priority that it once was.
now, Zad, I'll start with you. One great cost savings idea that you see in your region of the world or in, in global mobility in general um, that you're recommending to clients. And then uh, I'm going to ask the other, uh, the rest of you as well. And if you think of it, one cost savings idea that doesn't pay off the way everybody thinks it will. Mm. But I'll start with you now, Zad. Any great cost savings ideas when you meet with your customers in India? Uh, especially for India, I would say the cost saving would be to assess uh, each situation and then formulate the policy because not necessarily you are saving costs by giving, uh, not giving managed moves and giving lump sums and vice versa. So I think a good cost saving trip in India would be to analyze uh, the profile of the individual and then set, set a wide range of policies but implement those policies based on situations. Okay. Bill Niemer? I think one that is kind of a double-edged sword is that calculated allowance for certain benefits. So you take things like temp living and maybe the home finding trip and now maybe in the final move and you do some sort of a calculation and you give the employee that money and they can decide how they want to spend it. Mm -hmm. um, there was a thought by going to that that they, you know, you wouldn't be, they wouldn't be coming at, back to ask for more. Okay. Um, We've seen a trend away from that to now break it, break it apart because especially at some of the high level moves, we're hearing from the population that they don't have time to coordinate all the benefits or they don't have time to research all the, um, all the suppliers that they could possibly use. They want the managed benefits again. Um, and you, know, you wonder what's going to save more money or not. It really depends on the client program, what their um, uh, what their challenges are, but I've seen over the last six or seven years go from a, a, a large number of clients going to that managed uh, cash payment, um, going back now splitting the benefits back out. So we put them all into one and now we're starting to pull them back out again. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting and I don't think there's a right answer for for a general audience. I think it's it's individual to the client. You have to look at the data. Great. Marta? Three examples that come to mind. Uh, number one, VAT reclamation. Very easy way to bring some cash back to the, to the company. So we have a lot of um, customers that do business in the European Union and, and in Europe. And as we know, there is a 23, 21, 23% VAT. So I started doing that with a few of my customers and we have seen um, a great success. And uh, as Grable, our benefit is whatever we are able to reclaim. So it's purely performance based. So it really truly presents great um, cost savings to the client because ultimately they're getting 23% or close to that um, of the money spent in Europe. So that's one that has proven very successful for me. Um, second one is take a really good hard look at your policy and not necessarily at what you provide but the parameters behind it. Does employee really need 60 days of temporary accommodations? Um, a lot of times we need to book on a 30 to, uh, on a 30 day basis how can we work with our partners and suppliers to change that and to allow for more flexibility last but not least, if you have some hubs or some corridors where you have a lot of relocation, uh, work with your RMC to work with their partners to utilize the fact that you have a lot of volume coming into those um, places, different cities, and you can work on um, some discounts with, with partners. Once you add it all up, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, you can actually provide some significant cost savings or even avoidance, like changing that parameter on the policy. Nice. Thank you. Will? <laughs> I think those are the top three, but uh, to elaborate a little bit on from a policy perspective, and, and really uh, CoreFlex has only been in play for, I think, too short of a time to really assess the return on it, but you know the concept around uh, a, a transferee having skin in the game in terms of the benefits that he or she actually needs is valid and, and it also obviously you're not giving away a benefit that really wasn't a priority to begin with. So I think the very nature of that is cost savings. But it'll be interesting to have this conversation in another two, three, four years when not only are there more core flex programs out there, 
but the ones that were early adopters have had enough time to really assess what has this done from a cost savings perspective. I, I think there'll be tangible benefits from a cost savings perspective. Um, again, just based on the fact that you are, there is an element of I've got skin in the game and I am tailoring this based on what I need and I've got a limited, you know, I've got a limited kitty of points to, to attribute here. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna think smart um, about how I attribute those or Wonderful. allocate those. Um, guys, thanks for helping us verbalize the state of mobility report. As I mentioned, it's super deep. Uh, so I hope you spend some significant time with it. Uh, but thanks to my panelists uh, very much. Thank you.